Good afternoon. I see some people have stayed on. That's nice to know. Uh, my name is Emily Deedy, and I'm here just to more or less introduce the speakers and to give them a five-minute heads up at the end. Uh, the Welcome to the Case Study Nonprofit Organizational Redesign presented jointly by the Alliance for Home Health Quality and Innovation and the Visiting Nurse Associations of America. This session is being recorded, and so if you're asking questions at the end, we might have to have one of the speakers repeat that or bring the microphone out to you so that it's recorded also. Um, the continuing education ha activity has been approved for one contact hour by the Maryland Nurses Association, which is an accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. In order to receive your certificate of completion, you will need to attend this program it's in its entirety and complete the evaluation, which is available on your conference app. And if I can use it, you all are much better at it than I am. Uh, certificates of completion then are available at the registration dress desk. Our faculty has disclosed no financial conflict of interest. And some of you I gave conflicts of interest um, disclosure sheets when you came in. Um, if you want, they're still sitting on the conference table prior to coming in, and you can have one as you're leaving. So let me introduce our speakers. Con <laughs> Connie Evans is the Vice President of Home Care for Knut Nelson. She's responsible for leading a team of professionals providing the highest quality skilled care services to patients in their homes. Her leadership is nursing spans over 13 years, ranging from home care to med surgical environments. She holds a bachelor's from Presentation College in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and is a graduate of leading age MNs. <laughs> Leadership Academy. She's an active member of the Minnesota Home Care Association, serving as a regional chair, region three chairperson since 2010. Oh boy, that's a good one. <laughs> and she has ser served on the education team in 2012, the regulatory team in 2014 to 15, and currently serves on the legislation team. So that's great. I'm glad you're there. Nick Seabrook is the managing director and founding member at Black Tree Healthcare Consulting, which provides revenue cycle, outsourcing, and clinical consulting services to the healthcare industry. With more than 16 years of experience, Nick specializes in taking a consultative approach towards improving the daily operations of agencies throughout the country. More recently, He's become a frequent contributor to industry forums where he speaks at state associations as well as national conferences. So I'm sure we're gonna learn something very good. Thank you for being here and for being with us. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. All right, so our presentation today that Connie and I are gonna be giving is, is a case study. Um, the case study is gonna be the second part of the presentation where Connie's gonna go into detail about her agency and some of the work that uh, we had done out there with you know, the evaluation as, as Connie took over in that leadership role at, at Knut Nelson, um, really looking to improve their operations, and that's gonna be the second part. The first part of our presentation is really gonna focus on the revenue cycle. You know, overall revenue cycle operations, hopefully a couple of tidbits that you all in the room can, can take back and you know, look at your own agencies to see if there's areas where you think you can potentially improve your overall operations. So we start here with a couple of the disclosure statements for Connie and I, and then you know the learning objectives here. This is what we are seeking out to do with our presentation. Number one, the operational factors agencies should be focusing on at their organization. Number two, how you can identify the areas in which you can operate more efficiently. Number three, how to centralize your revenue cycle functions within your organization, which is uh, what Connie will go into again with the, the case study. And then number four, how to integrate both home health and hospice operations. Again, that'll be more uh, from the case study with Connie. So if you look here, this just an agenda on what we're gonna cover during the presentation. 
We're going to be jamming in a lot into an hour here, and I know we're the the first, you know, the the last thing here between you and your uh, cocktail hour. So we'll make sure to to stick within that hour time frame. So we're going to start with an overview of the revenue cycle. Then we're going to go a little bit more into some of the obstacles that that we typically see out there in the industry. Um, number three there, some of the solutions that we have for some of those different pieces within the revenue cycle. And then, you know, Connie's going to go more into her organization and then the case study. And we'll s save some time there at the end for some Q&A. So we'll start here with, with what is the revenue cycle. You know, this definition here we took right from the HFMA's uh, website, which defines the revenue cycle as all administrative and clinical functions that contribute to the capture, management, and collection of patient service revenue. You know, far too often I feel like people kind of misconstrue that the revenue cycle is just finance focused. And really you need to look at this next slide here to, to get the entire picture. And this is what we're going to go into in, in detail with some of those obstacles and solutions that we see. It's looking at it really from the top all the way from referral, you know, the intake process, going all the way through down to billing and collections and reporting and all those different steps in between. So we're going to detail out, again, some of those obstacles that we see within each of those uh, different departments and really what you can look at at your agency to, to see if, if there's opportunities for improvement in, in your overall operation. So how does the revenue cycle work? We always like to say it's the three-legged step stool. So you have the people, the process, and technology. You're looking at how all th three of those come together and really that, de that really determines how your overall workflow and your agency operates. The people, you know, who's actually doing those different tasks, how many people you have doing them, the processes, again, that workflow, looking to see from start to finish, uh, you know, how a patient is admitted all the way through to when you're actually collecting those dollars, and then the technology that you, you have in place uh, at your agency and, and how all three of those integrate. So again, we want to kind of have yourselves take a, a self-evaluation of your agency. When you're looking at your overall revenue cycle operations, these are the questions you want to be asking as you're evaluating each of those specific departments. Number one is, is what? So basically, what is the actual task that we're talking about? Number two, who, the who. It's, it's you know, who is responsible for completing each of those functions. Number three is the where. You know, where is it completed? And what, what revenue cycle department is that specific task being completed in? Number four, it's the when. When in that revenue cycle wheel that we saw, when is that task being completed? Uh, number five, the why. Why is that task being completed? Number six, the how. how. How is the actual process actually taking place? And then the, the last one there, the how many. How many people are, are required uh, to complete those functions? And again, we'll talk about some of the obstacles that we see um, when, when looking at each of those different questions. So what are some of the common obstacles that we, that we typically run into? Well, first and foremost, it's staffing. And when I say staffing, I don't mean necessarily the quality of the staff that you have. It's really more that quantity. How many staff do you have completing these different functions? And again, when you're evaluating that, you want to make sure that you are you know, not just looking at it, do I have enough staff? It's do I have too many staff completing certain functions? And that's a lot of times that we also see agencies where they might have you know, the intake staff where it's under staff, or maybe the authorization department where it's over staff. So looking at, at each of those individual functions and determining what those staffing levels should be. The other factor that we see here uh, that agencies, I think, get tripped up on sometimes is either growth, you know, your volume, looking at your volume. As your volume's decreasing and, or increase, are you properly evaluating the s staffing levels for those back office revenue cycle functions? Now, the first and foremost thought for most agencies when they see that census climb is, all right, the census is going up, I need to have more clinicians, we, we, we need more clinical staff to actually provide the visits, but they don't take into account some of those back office revenue cycle functions of, all right, I know that at a certain point if my census is 200 and it's jumped up to 250, I need to evaluate what the other staffing levels within that agency should be. Number two is, is the structure, and Connie, this will definitely apply for the case study here for some of the structure, is having that proper reporting system in place where there is clear delineation and you know that 
this person reports to that person reports to that person. Um, you know, some of the other common obstacles we see here within structure is really more of a siloed approach. We see it a lot when you're looking at your clinical department versus your finance, where you kind of have that divide and, and, and operating those silos. So structure is an, definitely another area where, again, um, we see some, some potential issues. Also within this structure is looking at centralization of certain functions. You know, if, if you don't have that proper structure in place where you really will gain those economies of scale by having uh, some of those central functions centralized, that again kind of ties into some of the common uh, structure obstacles we see. Third on the list here is, is duplication. So essentially some of those redundant processes that you might have in your agency, whether it be you're doing the same process more than once or you have multiple people doing the same process. So duplication is, is another common obstacle that we, we encounter. Number four is technology. So I would say a couple uh, obstacles related specifically to technology. Number one, not having the proper technology in place. And this isn't just saying your EMR. You know, it's looking at other technologies that might be available, whether it be uh, telehealth or you know other uh, other technologies that are really going to improve what the uh, what that efficient operation looks like. So that's the first piece is 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 necessarily you know having the proper technology in place. The other obstacle that we see is not properly using the technology that you have in place is, you know, if, for instance, for, with your EMR, not relying on the system itself for certain reports and, and managing certain revenue cycle functions, a lot of manual processes being done outside the system um, that's leading to, to an inefficient operation. Number five, it's, it's communication. You know, this is, again, kind of twofold. It's either under communication, where you're not communicating enough, um, you know, for instance, with, let's say with authorizations, you know, not having that communication process in place with your authorization department to your clinical folks to determine if you need to obtain additional authorization for a patient, uh, but then also over communication. You know, I'm sure we uh, we all have zero unread emails in our inbox right now. You know, being out here in San Diego, probably not. Um, you know, there's definitely an overabundance of communication that that we see taking place with, uh, you know, either through email, through phone calls, through the software system. So communication, you know, over communication, we we definitely see is an issue as well, and that kind of also ties back into that duplication. You know, we see a lot of that duplication of communication uh, in some instances as well. Productivity, you know, this is another. Uh, obstacle that we see is you know staff not hitting productivity numbers. One of the other obstacles that we see here with productivity is that there's so much focus when people think of you know home health and hospice productivity, they're thinking of number of visits your clinical staff are doing. One of the issues that we typically encounter is that there's not productivity measures in place for those non-clinical functions. So those back office staff should all have productivity standards put in place, and really that's. Uh, in order for you to, to determine proper staffing levels, you need to have those productivity measures in place to say that all right, our intake staff, our average productivity is 10 a day. And that way, if you have that productivity standard in place, you can, you can tie into the number of what your staffing need would be by saying, all right, if we have 40 referrals a day and that productivity standard is 10, you, know, you're, you need four FTEs to complete that function. So having those productivity uh, measures in place for your, your non-clinical staff is, is essential in order to, to know what those staffing levels should be. Accountability is number seven here. So accountability, this kind of ties back to the productivity. Once you have those productivity numbers in place, you know, you need to ha hold your staff accountable to hitting them. Um, and even, you know, if you're looking at some of those broken processes within the revenue cycle is, you know, having that, that plan in place where if you do have issues with staff not meeting productivity or not operating at the levels that are expected of them, you, know, you, need, you need to be holding those staff accountable, accountable because otherwise those process breakdowns can, can result in you know, unnecessary write-offs and, and lack of cash flow. Paper, you know, this is still, I think, uh, an issue where it's gotten better. I'll say as an industry, we've gotten better with, with, the, with paperwork, but there's still a lot of agencies killing a lot of trees out there where we see them, you know, they'll be managing a lot of processes, you know, printing out, reports and, and having the having the reports because that, that's just the way that they are, are able to visualize it better. Um, you know, this is still, again, I, I see I see it be a common issue, and but it is improving, I would say, overall uh, that we, we, uh, we see out there is, is just the overabundance of paper. 
And then management, really kind of holding, uh, you know, the, going back to the accountability piece, having the proper management in place, and really managing those specific functions. You know, looking at within that entire revenue cycle, if you don't have that structure, uh, you could have the structure in place, but if you're not overseeing it and having that proper management of those functions, again, it's gonna it's gonna be a, a failure. So now we're gonna kind of look at some of the specific issues within each of those revenue cycle departments or functions and, and kind of talk about um, you know, what some solutions and, and some, uh, some other metrics that we have in here as, as we go through uh, this piece of the presentation. So starting here first with intake. You know, some of the common issues that we see within the intake department are, number one, low conversion percentage. So this would be, you know, these are kind of, as we go through each of these slides, the issues really, you want to look at them as the, the red flags. If you have any of these potential issues at your agency, there's, you know, investigate to, to determine what, what could be potentially causing these. So low conversion for percentage, basically looking at your admissions compared to your referrals. Now, if you have a low conversion percentage, are you not getting the proper referrals? Is it, is it an education issue with your referral sources or with your marketing staff? Uh, number two, incomplete or incorrect documentation. So the information coming over from the referral sources either being incorrect or your intake staff incorrectly uh, keying the information in, or like I said, incomplete documentation as well, so not receiving enough of that information. Number three on here is delayed admissions. So looking at that time between the time a referral comes in the door to the time you actually go out and see that patient. If that number is, is, is high, that's again a, a red flag that there could, could be potential issues within that intake department. And then load productivity. Again, this is pretty much a common theme I think you'll, you, would, you would see for every single uh, revenue cycle function within here is if looking at what those productivity numbers are. And again, that's going back to that point that Having those productivity standards are, are key in order to, to measure that. Um, you know, looking at what those productivity numbers would be, that could be another issue is, is low productivity. So what are some solutions here then for, for some of these pieces within, within intake? Well, number one here, it's really that intake and marketing collaboration. And this goes back to uh, what I was saying before, that having that information and having that education with your, with your marketing staff to know Here's what a good referral looks like. This is what a, a, a homebound patient looks like. Uh, this is what a hospice appropriate patient looks like. So they, they have that information, give them the tools that they need uh, in order to, to really look at what that conversion percentage, get that conversion percentage up. In addition to that, you know, this is you know, working with your marketing staff to get the proper information that they need from the referral source so that you don't have those situations where you have incomplete or incorrect uh, documentation. Easy access to a referral log. Again, what, what we've encountered um, in the past with, with several agencies is doing that outside the system, you know, having a manual system where they might be getting a referral. Well, if we're not going to admit the patient, we don't know where we're not going to admit the patient. We're not going to enter that into the EMR. So having some kind of mechanism in place so that as the referrals come in, you're entering them in, even if it's a situation where, you know, you, the patient might be in the hospital, you might be getting a referral from a... Uh, from a hospital and the patient's going to be discharged in three days. You know, we recommend entering that, in, that in, the, in the system so it can sit there as a pending admission so that when you're running those pending admission reports, you'll know that, all right, I know this patient's not going to be admitted tomorrow or even the next day, but you're kind of keeping track on it so that the way the patient doesn't get lost. Flex and extend intake hours for coverage. I would say one of the, uh, another common issue that we run into is, you know, for hospital-based agencies or, you know, even agencies where you're getting a lot of referrals from hospitals uh, is probably the busiest time of the week for you is going to be Friday afternoon. You know, those patients where they're trying to get them out of the hospital, get them home before the weekend. Um, so looking at your referral patterns is really important to determine what, what, your, what your high days, you know, high volume days are from a referral standpoint and, that w and, and adjust your staffing accordingly. You know, I, I think a Having those staggered hours, I think, is a very good idea. You know, for if your intake starts at 7 a.m. and goes till 7 p.m., you're not you have that staffing where it's it's staggered. So you have some folks that are coming in from 7 to 2 or from from 7 to 3, and then have other staff that might start at 11 and go from 11 to 7, or even you know looking at options for 
part-time, uh, you know, if there's certain folks that you might have a very, very high day on Friday, Friday might be your highest day and you might have as many referrals coming in on Friday that you need to do the rest of the week. So looking to see what potential options you have with part-time workers so that, you know, if they're, they want some flexibility in their schedule to be able to only work one to two days a week, that you have them, you know, scheduled to come in for those days. The blended staffing model, this is another a recommendation that we typically have, you know, some intake departments that we've seen will have 100% clinical staff. Well, those are going to be, that's going to be a very expensive model for what that intake department looks like. You want to have a blend. So you're, there's definitely going to be certain intake folks that you, you have that are going to need to have that clinical mindset and they're going to have to have that clinical education. But you know, a lot of the intake process itself in terms of the entering the information and, and triaging that uh, throughout, through, uh, along through the revenue cycle, a lot of that's clerical function. So you, you really want to have that blended model of having a clinical and clerical blend for that. And then tracking productivity. Again, if they don't understand what their productivity expectations are, you can't hold them accountable. And, and again, they, they, they better, they want to have that sense of what their expectations are as well. So, you know, if you're looking at some, typically what we see in terms of what that productivity looks like, we have that breakdown there, clinical versus clerical. We know the clinical is going to take longer because they're dealing with more of the, uh, the clinical aspect of that patient. So we typically see, you know, between eight to 10 is really what that productivity number looks like. And that number is going to vary Every agency, I mean, th that's one disclaimer that we have as we go through some of these productivity numbers. Every agency is unique. So if you have a, you know, let's say you're a hospital system where you have all the referral information you need right in the system, and that's going to be a lot quicker process to triage those patients through. Um, so that number, that, that productivity number might be a little bit higher. So again, what we see typically is around 8 to 10 for clinical and clerical, really, again, they're just kind of pushing through, entering that information in the system. That's going to be more like a 15 to 20 uh, productivity number is what we typically see there. So the next uh, function here is looking at insurance verification. Some common issues we see here are denials for, for incorrect insurance. Um, number two, you know, this is, I think a lot of this has gotten to the situations where you have, you know, in the past, you might have just had an Aetna and there is only one Aetna plan underneath that. Now, Aetna, you know, you could have 15 different plans for Aetna, so not selecting that plan is definitely a common obstacle that we, uh, that we see and an issue that we see. Uh, other issues that might pop up are denials for no authorizations. Now, this, you might think, is more of a, an authorization issue, but these are gonna be situations where, let's say you had the patient where you admitted them, you thought that they were Medicare, and they ended up switching insurance to Aetna, and because of that, you know, you'd, you didn't find out until you already billed the claim to Medicare, and this was 60 days after the patient had, had been seen, so now you have to go back and try to get authorizations, and at that point, you know, it, it's too late and they don't grant retro authorization. So that's, you know, that will be a, a, uh, a flag and under that no authorization umbrella. And then number three, a high patient pay AR. So this is situations where you're not identifying what the patient pay is up front or, you know, even identifying what those copay amounts are. We all know that patient pay, once that ages out on your accounts receivable, the longer that ages out, the less likelihood you're going to have of collecting it. So that's another uh, red flag that we would see. So some different solutions here. You know, number one, having a designated staff for insurance verification. Uh, sometimes this is kind of a function that's absorbed by intake. We recommend that it's a separate function, usually combined with authorizations. Uh, number two, educating staff on which it payers your agency accepts. So this is an, you know, another big one where if you're not contracted with a certain payer, you may not get paid. So having that understanding um, for, for them of, of what, what payers that your agency takes is definitely a, a recommendation as well. Access payer portals. You know, some of those payer portals are not going to give you 100% of the information you need, but you could at least verify coverage and get a lot of the information that you would, uh, you would potentially need in order to verify what that coverage is. So definitely using those payer portals is something we recommend as well. Uh, determining those patient copays and deductibles up front, like I said, that's going to be your highest likelihood to be able to collect those patient pay dollars. So if you can identify them up front, that's definitely a key. And then increasing that verification frequency. You know, so, so often we see where the patient's insurance is only verified at intake. Well, if you have, you know, we know with open enrollment periods or even, you know, throughout the course of, of the year, patients will flip insurance, so change your insurance. So without having 
that insurance verification process taking place on a regular basis, and we, we recommend monthly here or, you know, at worst, at research. Um, you should also have your patients out there, your clinicians out there asking the patients when they have their visits. But this is, you know, this can create a major issues of, you know, not getting paid if you're not doing that verification and identifying those situations where the patient flipped insurance. And then automating that re-verification. So we don't mean necessarily you're calling the insurance company every time and, and saying, you know, we have a, we're just calling to verify the patient's had insurance. There's, a, there's a, a few softwares out there that do that verification process where you upload, um, you know, electronic f file to the system and it's gonna spit back an exception report with, all right, I had John Doe as Aetna, guess what, John Doe is now Medicare. So really having that process be automated is, is what we also recommend. So if you look here again for some productivity standards for Medicare, you know this is for the initial. This is a simple, a, a simple check. You can do that online. And Medicare's uh, common working file, we recommend. You know, the productivity standards should be over 100 a day for that. And then for non-Medicare, it's going to be a more time-consuming process. You're probably going to be getting that initial authorization on that phone call. Um, as you're verifying the insurance, so that's probably more like a 20 a day. And again, for the ongoing, we, we recommend the batch process. The next function here is authorizations. And some of the issues that we see with authorizations, number one, denials, you know, denials for lack of authorizations. Number two, a backlog in authorization requests. So this could be, you know, lack of response time from your clinical staff, or it could be a situation where that process itself isn't being managed properly and you're not reaching out to your clinicians in a timely manner. And then number three, you know, delays and starts of care. If you have certain payers where you're waiting to get that authorization before you go out to see them, that could be another uh, potential issue. So some solutions here, you know, again, designated staff for authorizations. This is a, another recommendation where you don't want to have this kind of be, you know, combined, have it almost be an ancillary uh, responsibility for someone. There's still agencies that we see out there who the clinicians are responsible for authorizations. They're still, you know, the clinicians are the ones who are reaching out to the insurance company to get the authorizations. We definitely don't recommend that. You know, you want to get your clinicians doing what they're, uh, what you brought them in to do, and that's and that's provide that patient care. So again, we definitely recommend having an authorization department to to handle authorizations. Number two, you know, accessing payer portals. Again, a lot. Uh, we've seen a lot a lot more sophisticated technology and ability to request those authorizations online with or certain payer portals so it's important uh, to identify which payers you can you can request those authorizations for uh, looking on on uh, online systems standardizing the documentation and the EMR for authorizations so essentially you know your authorization department reaches out to the clinical staff you, we always recommend if it's possible to do that in the EMR do that in the EMR manage the whole process in the a EMR that way you know you have that documentation right there in the system. Your clinical staff should be responding and you should have a standard format for what their response looks like. You know, I'm requesting 2X9 SN visits, you know, basically saying here's the number I'm requesting and here's the frequency and duration for that so that, you know, it's consistent and, and, and e easily uh, interpreted. Number four here, proactively identify expiring authorization reports. So what we recommend here is, is Definitely, you know, you don't want to have this process being managed manually. And again, we still we we see everything. So, you know, we've seen it all in terms of some folks where they're still managing everything. I got my patients in my folders here. These are the patients I'm going to be following up on this week. Most of your EMRs should have some kind of reporting functionality to be able to identify expiring authorizations. So, you want to look at that two different ways. You want to look for certain uh, authorizations that are ending by date and then your authorizations ending by the number of visits so that you know if let's say you have an, a, a patient where you got authorized for six visits you're at visit number four you should probably be starting that process at that point to reach out to the clinician and say are we going to need to request additional authorizations same point you know that you're going to have that duration um, with that authorization so looking at you know if today's April 20th, and I know that my authorization is expiring on April 25th. Well, again, that's probably a time to start reaching out to your clinical staff to say, all right, our, all it's about to expire, do I need to request additional? Communicate with clinicians in advance of authoring, uh, expiring offs. Again, this is another common issue that we see is just not having that timely follow-up with the, with the clinical staff to, be, uh, to, to start that process. And we know also, I think, having that understanding for your payers of how long it typically takes them 
to process the auth request. Some of your payers are probably going to be uh, essentially immediate. Some are going to be 24 to 48 hours. Others may be longer, maybe five days or seven days. So you should really set up what your process is for that follow-up based on how quickly those, those uh, payers typically get back to you. And then holding clinicians uh, accountable for visits made without authorization. Again, this is something where you know, they need to understand that if they're providing these visits without authorizations, that they're not getting paid for it, that you're not getting paid for it. So having them, you know, holding them accountable to, for that timely communication back to the uh, authorization department so you can get those also that are needed. And then in terms of, again, productivity standard here for your non-Medicare, uh, that initial authorization, again, is at 15 to 20 a day. And how we typically look at productivity for authorization or how it's typically looked at from a staffing perspective is it's more the census. So you're looking at potentially 100 to 150 FTE or daily, average daily census per FTE for your authorizations group. And again, this is just for your non-Medicare uh, census for what that, what that number looks like. And again, that number is going to fluctuate based on if you have a lot of payers that you can just request authorization online, you know, that number is going to be significantly increased. The next function here is looking at scheduling. So a couple of issues that we typically see here. Number one, high number of missed visits, you know, where you're, you're scheduling the visits and you know, the, the visit never happened. Either the, the patient wasn't notified and, and, and you know, when, you, when the clinician went to, the, the, to make the visit, the patient wasn't there, or for whatever reason, the, the clinician didn't have time to get out to see the patient. Number two, high start of care to eval lag time. So basically when that first visit's made, you know, having that therapy evaluation scheduled, you shouldn't really have that big of a gap there. It should be same day, next day, you know, at, at worst 48 hours later. Uh, that's another uh, red flag that you would typically see. And then number three, high staff turnover, or high, sorry, high staff overtime, looking at those additional hours that are being put in by the scheduling staff. So some solutions here, you know, number one, using a systematic approach in your EMR for scheduling. We still see agencies that are scheduling outside the system. We definitely do not recommend that. You want to make sure that your scheduling in the system, it's going to be a lot easier to manage. Having that, you know, transparency this, so that your scheduling staff are able to see here's this person's schedule, here's who has capacity, here's who doesn't. Um, a lot of, you know, if, if we look at some of the EMRs, they're definitely, I think, bulked up so they're scheduling portals so that it's a lot more user-friendly and, and, and easier to, to manage the, the whole scheduling process. Number two, approving that frequency of visits. So how many visits am I going to make? You know, not just doing it one at a time, um, looking at the overall what that plan of care is and plotting that out over uh, what that approved time is. Number three, using that pending report. Again, use, that should be really what you're using to, uh, to prioritize what those start of care dates look like. Again, the, kind of what my point back before, talking about when the referrals are actually coming in to enter them in the system, even if you don't have a potential start of care date yet. Um, scheduling those start of care visits within 24 to 48 hours. And then, you know, this is, again, this is going to be one of those agency specific. You know, some agencies, it makes sense to centralize scheduling. Others prefer, it works better for them to have their clinicians self-scheduling. So looking at what makes sense for, for you, um, and again, I would say look at those potential red flags. If you're seeing those potential red flags, that might be a sign to go with one way or the other uh, between centralized versus self-scheduling. So if you look here, just uh, another productivity standard here, right around two to three hundred uh, census FT, you know, two to three hundred census per FTE for your scheduling department. The next section here, looking at patient management. So some of the uh, some of the issues that we see here, red flags, again, number one would be high lupa percentage. Number two would be under or over visit utilization. Uh, and then number three would be inconsistent research percentage. Again, the, some of the, the high lupa percentage, that could be an indication that you're not really managing those, those patients appropriately. You're going to have some, some lupas that are going to be lupas no matter what. You know, your cath changes, you're not going to have more than you know, one, to, one to two visits a month. Um, you know that, but it's really the the loopas that could have been prevented are the ones that you want to look at. So some solutions here, you know, episode management, really having that more proactive approach to how you're managing your patients, having case conferences on a regular basis um, where you're discussing the plan of care and and really the the progress for each of those patients is you know an essential piece to have in place in order to properly uh, manage that patient's care. 
uh, lupa management, specifically, again, looking at some of your lupas. You know, if your lupa percentage is higher than what we have down there for that national average lupa rate of 10%, you want to look to see, do an analysis to see, all right, which of these could have been avoided and what's the root cause of, of what, call, what, what created that lupa. Um, looking at the, so that kind of ties into the analyzing the lupas retrospectively and proactively, the unavoidable versus avoidable lupas, really the staff education. You know, I think this is another key piece is having those staff understand, all right, for your lupa patients, you're only getting reimbursed per visit compared to, you know, what you would have gotten reimbursed from an episodic standpoint. Um, having that education where they understand how PPS reimbursement works is, is definitely, a, a, I think, a, a key recommendation there. Establishing a process for your research, you know, how uh, during those case conferences, is it something that if you have patients coming up on research that you're identifying it during that time, you really should have a process for how you're evaluating those patients as, it come up, as they come up on research. And then trending your data, looking at over time what your loop of percentages, what your average visits per episode are, looking at that data over time is another, another key factor as well. You can see there are some of the uh, national averages which came from SHP, that loop rate of 10.1% and the average visits per episode is 17.4. Uh, Oasis completion is the next piece here. So two issues that we typically see, number one is high days to wrap. And then number two would be a low case mix. So certain, situ certain solutions that you want to look at here is really having, number one, that financial and clinical collaboration so that you know, your financial staff are saying, here's the wraps that we can't get out the door yet because those, those uh, Oasis haven't been locked. You know, having that collaboration is really key to, uh, to make sure that you're having all your unbilled claims go out the door. Number two, a weekly revenue cycle meeting. Again, you know, determining, all right, here's, we know we have 50 wraps that are uh, waiting to be billed once we get those Oasis locked. What's the status of them? When can we expect them to get out the door? Uh, you know, having that communication is, is important. Number three, the five-day rule here. This is, you know, one of our clients actually had this uh, five-day rule that they came up with where within five days, the Oasis 485, the start of care visit, and that second visit all have to be done within that five-day time period. So looking at, you know, where do you, where does that fit in with your agency and, and seeing what may, what make, might make sense for, uh, for how that's set up. Number four here, accountability for the clinician response time. That's, you know, that OASIS review process, you're looking at, you know, number one, the clinician going out and making that visit, then they're creating the OASIS, then the second step is really having your QA staff do their initial review. If they have questions, they're going to go to your clinical staff. So having that clinical response time uh, is really imperative to making sure that that OASIS co completion process is, is, is timely. So having that clinician feedback and then, you know, the QA staff making their recommended changes or giving the recommendation recommendations to your clinical staff and then having that clinical response time to actually fix and lock the OASIS is imperative. So publishing, you know, other suggestions here, publishing case mix weight by clinician. I think it's good, you know, to have those those scorecards where you're looking at a per, you know, clinician basis, you know, drilling down. A lot of this is, you know, we'll, we'll see this in a couple additional slides here is the importance of the drill down, uh, looking at those those case mix weights by clinician. Implementing a performance improvement plan. So if you're looking at your clinical, if your case mix is, you know, 1.069, which is the uh, the average, if you have clinicians that are under that, you know, if, if it's a continuing trend, well, is it is it an education gap? And having a performance improvement plan to really, you know, take those steps necessary to give them the education they need to, to more accurately complete the OASIS. And then trend those key indicators. Documentation management here, so what we mean by that is really looking at your orders, outstanding orders, unsigned orders, and your uh, outstanding face-to-face. -face. So two issues that we see here typically, number one is a high number of unsigned orders, and number two really is an increased unbilled AR. So looking at that unbilled AR is really, for, in most cases, or your uh, high percentage chance your final claims are being held up for one of two reasons, either missing orders or missing face-to-face. So some solutions here. Number one, you know, obtaining as much information at intake as possible. And there's some agencies now that aren't even taking patients unless they have that completed face-to-face -face document. Um, is that something we recommend? Probably not. Uh, if it was my agency, I probably wouldn't do go to that extreme. But you know, some agencies are are going to that extreme of of not taking those patients without it. One of the key pieces here, I think, is the accuracy of identifying which your physician that's going to be completing that face-to-face -face and 
or and signing the orders. Um, you know, far too often we see where agencies aren't identifying that correct physician. You know, or they might be identifying the physician who's creating the face-to-face, -face, but they're not identifying the correct one that's going to be signing the orders. So if you're sending those orders out, and the the physician's going to look at it and it's like, this isn't you know, my patient, so I'm not going to be signing these orders. So that really kind of leads to the next solution here is establishing what that protocol is for follow-up. So we recommend here faxing, you know, if electronically sending the order um, as often as possible. I was actually at an agency last week that's still hand delivering by courier all the orders to all their physicians because one of the physicians in their network didn't like the fax, so they changed the process so all physicians get courier deliveries on a weekly basis. Um, so we definitely recommend electronically submitting faxes, or electronically submitting those orders. And then having that timely follow-up. So if you haven't received that order in seven days, chances are you're not gonna get it unless you follow up. So having that refax, um, if you don't receive it within seven days, if seven days later you still haven't received it, it's picking up that phone and, and making a phone call to see what the, what the status of the orders are. Um, placing a third call at, at that 21 day mark and then at some point, you know, if you haven't received it and it's 30 days in, you wanna utilize your marketing staff, your liaisons who are out in the field who are actually visiting those physicians to deliver them and get those signatures on those claims. So follow up, you know, some other recommendations here, follow up by physician rather than patient. You know, if you have, you're looking at your outstanding orders and I have 100 orders that are outstanding and there's, you know, 20 physicians, you want to do that follow up by physician. And then establishing incentive for your teams for, you know, getting those orders in in a timely manner. And then also, you know, another solution potentially would be utilizing electronic uh, physician signature portal. So for this one, our, um, you know, if you're looking at what, what our, recommended staffing levels here, it's by physicians, which is missing a P incorrectly, um, looking at about 600 physicians. Um, typically we recommend you should be able to make 30 phone calls a day, so if you're looking at 20 business days a month, that ties into that 600 number. The next one we have on here is looking at your supply drug and DME management. And a couple of issues here, number one, high, you know, your high, high costs, high costs of your supplies, drugs, or DME. Number two, issue here is timely access of those supplies, drugs, and DME for your patients. So some solutions here. Number one is knowing that cost per patient and trending that out over time. You know, you should, th that should be something that you, you know for your, your patients, what those average costs are for each of those. Um, another solution there is drop sh shipping supplies rather than having your clinical staff go to the office to pick up your supplies. You know, having them drop ship at the patient's house is much more, uh, it's going to, it's going to promote that supply to get there in a more timely manner and keep your clinician out from, from having to go to the office to pick those supplies up. Reviewing your formulary on a regular basis, again, so you're only ordering off the formulary um, or as often as possible ordering off that formulary, that's going to be your, your more discounted um, you know, supplies, so you should be using that as often as possible. And then engaging with a pharmacy benefit management company you know, to get to promote getting better access for, for, your, uh, for your drugs and then also for uh, engaging with a DME benefit management company to you know, get access to that DME. The next one here we have is billing and collections. So you know some issues we typically see here. Number one, high accounts receivable. Number two, low collectability of the receivable. And then number three, that incon inconsistent cash flow. Um, so some solutions here. Number one, billing wraps daily. There's still agencies that we we see where they're not billing wraps on, you know, they're billing wraps once a month. Um, you know, we definitely recommend billing daily. Depending on what your volume is, it might only be need to be three times a week, but definitely on a, on a frequent basis, you want to be getting those wraps out the door. That's going to be your, your steady cash flow you have coming in for Medicare. Number two, electronically submitting claims and also electronically receiving remits. That's going to save a lot of time with not only the claims processing and, and cash flow, increasing cash flow, it's also gonna save you a lot of time for your posting if you're able to import that electronic remit and only have to post the exceptions rather than having to post everything uh, manually, it's gonna save, uh, save a lot of time. Number three, you know, this kind of goes back to one of the recommendations we had before with having those regular meetings between clinical and finance is having that collaboration for anything, you know, looking at those unbilled reports to determine best course of action or better, you know, better timing on when claims are going to be able to go out the door. Number four, following up on monthly, uh, following up on a monthly basis on all aged AR aged over 60 days. So you want to have every single account that's aged over 60 days being touched once a month. 
And that's, you know, if you're looking at what those staffing levels should be, um, you know, for, for your non-Medicare, we always try to measure what those productivity, what the uh, productivity is based on that 30 accounts worked a day. And that's how you're gonna tie into what those staffing levels should be. So again, if you're looking at, you know, 30 accounts a day, 20 business days a month, that's around 600 accounts that they can manage. We typically reduce that uh, by a couple days just for the other billing functions that they typically are gonna have to do for those billers. So looking at that 500 accounts aged over 60 days is really what you should be plugging in to determine what your staffing level should be. Billing in monthly increments is another recommendation we have here. There's a lot of agencies that we see, they bill in weekly increments. All that is creating is four times the work for your billing staff. So you could have a patient that has four claims a month, and again, for your non-Medicare patients, a lot of those, the follow-up is gonna be a very manual process where you have to pick up the phone, and you know some of those insurance companies will only take, you, know, we're only, you can only call on three claims for this call, and again, you're limited for what you can call on in a day. So really, that's where we have that productivity standard of 30. Um, you know, if you're, if you're billing in those monthly increments as opposed to weekly, you only have one claim to follow up on versus four. Trending denials by reason to give more insight into revenue cycle issues. Again, this is gonna be tying back to you know, the, kind of that root cause analysis. A lot of what we see when, uh, when you have high accounts receivable, one of the reasons is, is a lot of those revenue cycle issues are gonna flow downhill to billing. And if you have authorization issues, if you have insurance verification issues, if you have orders tracking issues, that's gonna be the reason why you have a high AR. And so being able to trend those certain denials or those unbilled reasons is gonna be you know, vital to getting more insight into your overall operation. And then setting the productivity and cash goals for your staff is another you know, important thing that you, you definitely wanna do at your agency. So you can see there, while we do manage what those FTE levels should be by uh, accounts, total claims over 60 days, for Medicare it's more, since it's most of your Medicare follow-up is gonna be done online, that's more managed, if we're, if we're looking at what the um, capacity should be, that's gonna be more based on revenue. So you can see there, you know, we, we recommend a Medicare biller should be able to manage between 15 and $25 million of annual revenue. A hospice biller is gonna be a little bit higher just because you have a higher average claim balance, so that's gonna be more like you know, 25 to 35. And then reporting. So some of the issues we see here is not enough reporting. You don't have enough information. You know, you're not, you're not visible enough with some of the, your key performance indicators. Um, so you don't really have as good insight into your overall operations. Number two, on the flip side there, too much reporting. So, you know, you're getting inundated with all these reports and no one's looking at them. You know, they're getting so many reports that they're, they're not doing the analysis piece of it and really kind of digesting what it actually means. So number three, really that's not looking at the right data. Um, and then really the time consuming reporting process is, is the fourth one we see a lot of, you know, we're creating these reports, but it's taking us, all, we're doing them essentially a bunch of workarounds in order to create those reports. So some solutions here, number one, developing dashboards. You know, looking at, and your dashboards are gonna be different, and this is in a couple bullets here, depending on level. You know, if I'm a CEO of an agency, I'm gonna to wanna to see some high level stats compared to if I'm a clinical manager, I'm gonna to wanna to be drilling down more and seeing some, some of those more detailed stats. So developing dashboards for each of those uh, levels, positions within your agency is, is definitely a key. Number two is determining the source of the information. Where, where are you getting the information from? What report are you running to get that? Um, you know, that's, a, that's also a key piece there. Number three, if you're not able to get the information you need uh, for, for your dashboard, tap into an, an ancillary software. See if there's other, um, you know, other softwares out there that is gonna get you the information that you need. Number four, presenting the data differently for the appropriate audience. Again, understanding that the CEO is gonna need to see that information differently than your clinical manager. High level for the executive team, drill down for that management team. And again, it's really not only accruing the data, getting that data, but also doing the analysis piece of, all right, this is what the data means. And then really that third step is acting on the data. All right, if I know that there, these numbers aren't where they need to be, what's our plan to get them you know, back up to par? So with that, I'll turn it over to Connie. Well, Nick left me with eight minutes, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll make this go quickly. Okay. Okay, um, I'm here with Knut Nelson Home Care. We are based in Minnesota. Um, we currently offer skilled nursing, PT, OT, speech, home health aid, technology, and homemaking services. 
We employ approximately 120 employees. And we have our parent office located in Alexandria, like I said, but we also have nine branch offices spread out across 29 counties in west central Minnesota. Um, our current census in home care is 683, and for hospice, we serve 51 clients. Uh, our home care agency was founded in April 2004 in Alexandria, and from 2009 to 2015, we added nine branch offices. Um, we added our hospice service line in 2013, um, and we also experienced a leadership change in November of 2015. And our change in leadership allowed for us to step back and reevaluate our current processes and determine which changes we needed to make to be sustainable into the future. Technical difficulties, one moment. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, the reason we had brought Black Tree in was because we wanted to have a neutral party review and analyze our current structure and processes. Um, we wanted to make sure that our agency was set up to experience clinical, operational, and financial success into the future. Our goal was to have the appropriate systems and processes in place to be able to sustain growth without the need to continue to add positions. We had many duplicated processes in place due to the rapid growth we experienced over the years and were in need of realignment. Okay. Okay. Um, in regards to our structure, these are a few of the areas that were identified that we needed to address. Um, we had many inefficient processes with our revenue cycle functions due to the lack of centralized processes. We had multiple staff with the same job title and job description performing completely different tasks, and it was leading to increased job dissatisfaction and burnout. Um, one example of this was our intake nurse position. We had an intake nurse in every single office who had different responsibilities and all of our hospice revenue cycle functions were separate from our home health revenue cycle functions. Um, our hospice and home care agency had many operational processes that were in need of being combined. And process. Okay. In regards to our process, we were in need of productivity standards for our non-clinical employees to ensure that we had clear goals and expectations set for our team. We had many duplicated positions and processes throughout our agency due to the rapid growth. The processes were decentralized and therefore we had duplication throughout operations. We were in need of appropriate systems to be sustainable for future growth. Then, in regards to technology, we were looking for ways to improve our business, including clinical, operational, and financial aspects. We were gathering the data from our current software, but we were not doing anything with it. And also, we were not using our EMR effectively. Okay. For um, recommendations, Blacktree had given us a very specific implementation plan with recommendations based off of short, mid, and long-term range deadlines. The very first thing that we implemented was centralization of our back office team. When we created this, we were setting these positions up to be able to provide coverage for both our hospice and home care teams. This started with our billing team. We realigned who was responsible for which pieces of the billing and authorization process and therefore allowed for our team to become experts in their area. Prior to Black Tree's recommendations, we had an intake nurse in almost every single office. Through the centralization of that role, we now have two intake nurses and a receptionist who filters phone calls to ensure only intake calls land with the intake team. Other duties that the intake nurses had performed in the past now have been reassigned to the schedulers, authorization, billing, and medical records personnel. Another area of recommendation was to review and realign the tasks that our leadership team was responsible for and streamline any overlapping areas. Each of our branch offices had a clinical nurse manager who provided oversight to all of the staff that functioned out of their office except for the therapy team. 
We had a therapy manager who provided oversight to all of the therapists, regardless of the office that they worked out of. Through eliminating this role, we were able to improve workflow as the therapists now report to the clinical nurse manager respective to their office. This has also helped improve communication and decrease silos as we are now able to function as a team of one. We have also implemented bi-weekly interdisciplinary team meetings in all of our branch office locations to improve communication and collaborate among the teams in regards to patient-specific issues. Um, the results of our agency centralizing our processes and shifting our focus has allowed for increased job satisfaction and appropriate goal setting throughout our home care and hospice divisions. It has definitely been a mind shift for our entire agency and required a lot of communication to the entire team to ensure that we kept people informed and engaged. One additional benefit that we experienced due to realigning our teams was the fact that we are now set up to have a true interdisciplinary team. This has allowed us to have improved patient care due to increased communication and collaboration. Through implementing a bi-weekly interdisciplinary team meeting, we have increased our quality of patient care star rating from a two and a half to a three and a half, and our patient survey star rating increased to a four. In the last slide here, I just highlighted some of the areas that we have experienced improvements so far. And just so you know, Black Tree came, back to, um, came to us on site in February of 2016. So these are just a few of the different areas that we have experienced success. Great, see? So, thank you. All right, with a minute to spare, we have time for questions. See? Yeah, I, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, questions amongst the group? Um, it was a little bit challenging at first, but the thing that worked was that I constantly shared the why about why we needed to make these changes. We were at a point, we had so much rapid growth and so many duplicated positions that were not necessary that we knew we would not be sustainable into the future. And so I just had to be honest, I drove around to our branch offices and met with the intake nurses in person and shared the message with them. And we didn't eliminate their positions immediately. Um, we started with working with our billing team first to make sure they were set up to be successful, and then we moved on to intake. It was quite the process to get there, but we've m made it. <laughs> um, and right now, we are using Home Care Home Base. We just went live with them January 25th. So we were with HealthWise before. Any other yep. questions? All right. Hopefully we'll see you at the, uh, the cocktail hour. Thank you. Thank you.